Welcome to the Startup Grind. Let's talk a little bit about our guest of honor tonight. So, this dude, Mario, which Kelly, it is Mario, right? It is. It's so, Mario. it is. So, for those of you that think it looks like Mario, it's Mario. Mario. <laughs> little tip there, all right? He's really cool about not caring if people say it wrong. But just a little tip I like to point out. All right, so Mario actually has been very involved in the community for a long time here. Not only did he see a problem and decide to build a solution for it years ago, but he took that company. We all know that an idea is great and all, but it's in the execution of the idea that you really have to prove yourself. And he did that. He built a rock star company here in the Valley, and he actually had the opportunity to exit it a few years ago. This guy could be hanging out on beaches all day every day, which he does do some of that, and that's good, right? <laughs> or something like that. Maybe it's a uh, four buys or something, I don't know. But um, instead, he has actually spent a lot of time the past couple of years really turning around and looking to give back, looking to find ways to help other people pursue their dreams and make them a reality. So not only is he an amazing and very active angel investor, but he is also a huge community supporter. He's um, one of the people that is, I guess, the chairperson of Venture Madness. Anybody heard of Venture Madness? Okay, we're gonna work on that too. Um, so we'll talk about that as we sit down today. But he's the chairman of Venture Madness this year, and he also has really been one of the key driving forces be behind StartupAZ.org, which is a really cool thing that's kind of coming and in the works to help startups have that initial help that they need to be able to be successful. So it is my honor and pleasure to introduce this man to you, and I'm gonna have you get up on your feet and give a warm Startup Grind welcome to Mario Martinez. <laughs> All right, so at Startup Grind, um, one of the key things that we like to do is to get to know you a little bit as a person before we start talking business. So tell us a little bit about where you grew up, the kind of culture and family you grew up in. Where'd Mario come from? Where'd Mario come from? Well, first off, thank you, Christy, for everything that you're doing. And uh, to the audience, thank you all for coming out tonight. Truly humbled by uh, the uh, support, so love it. Glad to be here tonight. Um, actually, I was, I was born in New York City, so I don't know if anybody knows that at this point, but um, East Coast kid. So grew up, uh, was born in Manhattan, grew up in Brooklyn uh, until I, I was about 13 years old. And uh, my dad was a New York City cop at the time and uh, just got tired of the whole scene and decided that uh, it was time for us to transition away from the New York kind of environment and, and transitioned us over to Pennsylvania in, in the Pocono Mountains, if anybody's familiar with that. So, uh, which wow, is actually a <laughs> quite the shift from uh, Brooklyn to, to the mountains for sure, no question. But uh, definitely grew up with you know both sides, I guess the, the best of both worlds in a sense, um, and which is actually the time when I met my wife as well at uh, junior high school is when we first uh, connected and then have been together since uh, high school, high school sweethearts. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <clears throat> so, yep, yeah, so Pennsylvania, I mean, I, I, 18, 19 years old, we had our son as well. So I think that's uh, another key point here to, you know, for everybody to understand and recognize. I'm approaching 40 and my son's going to be uh, 21 next month, wow. or this month, actually. <laughs> yeah. A couple more, wow. another 13 days, actually. So a uh, pretty wild, uh, you know, start, I guess, you know, a little challenging in the sense of uh, <laughs> some inspiration. He likes to take the credit for everything that I've accomplished. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and then we had our daughter a couple years later and uh, who happens to be here tonight as well. Um, both kids were born in Pennsylvania. I actually started working at, uh, at an auto parts store of all places, which is where I really learned customer service. If you think about it, anybody who walks into an auto parts store is probably pissed off about something, yes, right? They, they, they don't want to uh, be there and uh, are a little distracted in their day and, and you have to troubleshoot, right? So trying to get to the heart of the problem. Learned a lot of great skills through that whole time. Um, but met some customers that were working at a software company in East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania at the time, a company called Cornet International, catered to the pharmaceutical industry. First generation Salesforce automation systems that uh, we're coming to market, and if you guys remember the Apple Newton, everybody know that uh, there was an iPhone, in essence, uh, in the early 90s that came out. Well, that company was building software on that for the pharmaceutical space at the time. 
Um, came into that company, ended up applying for a job, came in as a uh, temp through a temp agency and um, started answering the phones on the help desk. That's how it all oh my started. Gosh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. So connected with a bunch of sales reps over the years and you know just through that whole process and getting to know you know the business, the industry, every aspect of um, you know that particular company and, and how it catered to the sales and marketing side uh, or commercial operations side of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, which is hence why 360 came to be and why we focus on that. Basically, when you look at 360 Vantage, it was the next generation version of all that. Uh, everything that we learned at that point that we were able to take with us. So um, tell us a little bit about that. So you spent some time. How many years were you in? You were in pharmaceutical sales or just kind of connected to it? So I started off at that software company, was mm -hmm. there for about two years. Okay. Ended up getting hired by a uh, client of ours, a company called Azi Pharmaceuticals that was launching um, in the U.S. So launching their first sales team. And, you know, a funny story about this is all of my technology experience is really self-educated, right? So Windows 95 was like the hot thing, right? People were standing out, you know, out, outside of, you know, stores wrapped around corners trying to get their updated CD, right? So at the time, we're <laughs> floppy disk, actually. And uh, that was something that I, I actually, you know, embraced pretty early on. Um, and, and the reason I did is because I was actually a DJ at the time, so. <laughs> and I was, I was trying to do everything you can do so simply now on your phone. I was trying to do in a computer, record all my music and try to drive some efficiency so I can create tapes and sell those, right? And I was actually already selling at a pretty early stage That's just awesome. during high school, trying to make some money that way. <laughs> and uh, had a lot of fun with all of that, but uh, again, just self-educated, constantly upgrading my computer, which led me to that software kind of role inside of that company gotcha. um, to then getting hired into the industry. So I actually got hired by one of my clients, which Azai was a startup in essence in the US. It was a Japanese company. Um, had 76 sales reps. They were launching their first product, which was Aricept. Aricept is an Alzheimer's therapy at the time, the new gold standard towards trying to slow down the effects of Alzheimer's. Right, pretty powerful mission and, and just whole message and, and, and really the execution was great overall. So in year one, that company is, uh, launched and achieved 200 million in sales. Wow. I ended up joining them in 98, February of 98. So it was kind of the first time the family got you know, a little dose of uh, the, the traveling or kind of moving away aspect of things. We, we left Pennsylvania, moved to New Jersey. Um, that was quite the transition at the time. It was you know, two or three hours away. Family wasn't happy because the grandkids are no longer that close, right? Yeah. So um, anyway, so we we end up with the joining this company, going through the process of uh, year one, 200 million in sales. By the time I left in 2003, we were at one and a half billion in sales, just in the U.S. So it was an, an amazing time. And, I, and remember, I was 20 years old at that point when I joined this company. And when I left, I was probably around 27, which is when we came out to Arizona at the time. And that's all I knew. It was, you know, great execution, great organization, great mission, great people, great leaders, and just got a chance to witness that firsthand. Uh, we had, you know, co-promotions with uh, companies like Pfizer and J&J &J and so on. And mm -hmm. my whole purpose and focus throughout my entire career has always been making sales reps as effective as possible, leveraging technology. Uh -huh. Never really cared about anything else, like anything that's going on in finance, manufacturing, research, <laughs> not my problem, right? It's all about making the sales team as effective as possible and, and using technology to the max. So you saw a gap in the daily workflow of some reps. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. And, and I was a buyer, right? So I kind of I went from being the help desk kid to coming in at the entry level role inside of Azi to then climbing the ranks inside of that and then leading the sales technology department um, by, the, by the time, you know, five and a half years later, gotcha. six years later. Managing a nine million dollar budget, you know, now going from making less than eighteen thousand dollars a year to approaching the six figure range, right? And um, just had a fun, great time and great opportunity to to execute and experience things that most people that age don't really get a chance to to do. Um, funny story around that. I remember those we we're building a data warehouse, the first kind of wave of all of this stuff, and. Um, we called in all these different vendors. It was me and this, you know, another key uh, guy in our department, the sales operations department at the time. And PwC came in. So Price Waterhouse, right? And at the time, they had a technology division. And they're looking at us like, when, where are your parents, right? <laughs> it's like, where are the adults? 
It's like, no, we're making a decision, right? Like, you got to impress us and uh, pitch us and let's go through the process. And they, didn't, they did not get the business. But, uh, <laughs> I'm sure. So I, from there, we, you know, it's, it, it was a fun run at Azi. Yeah. Um, they got recruited to come out to Arizona. So. Oh, so they came out to Arizona. They did not. The company did not. I, I got recruited by a local company in Scottsdale okay, to come gotcha. out this way. All right. So then what made you step away from your comfortable, awesome job and decide to launch a company? So a couple of things, you know, all along the way, I mean, throughout that entire experience, I always had concepts and ideas that I wanted to go after. Just never really felt ready. Right. It was one of those things that just it was more of a personal kind of, you know, do I have the acumen at this point, the business acumen to go after it and go get it. Didn't have the connections, the network or any of that aspect as well. Um, so we, yeah, I would kind of execute these projects and these ideas inside the business and create these cool new products um, and, and do it with vendors and, and, you know, see it from start to finish and, and see it actually being utilized, but never really had the chance to, to do it on my own, right? And when I came to, to Arizona, it was the first time I got a chance to baseline myself against a brand new team of people that I knew no one, right, at that point. So now it was a question of what, what am I learning here? Right? I'm 27 years old. I, I spent about two and a half years with this company. And what I realized pretty early on is I'm, I'm not really learning much from many people here. They're actually learning from me. And I'm executing fairly effectively. I think I might be ready. And this is a US public company doing good things. But there was something that I was bringing to the table that just wasn't available there. Right? So it was, uh, and, and we were executing well and had a fun time there through that process. But that company decided they were going to acquire another organization. It's about a $2.9 billion deal at the time when it got announced. My budget dried up as a result, so I couldn't execute my projects. So I jumped on the integration teams. And we're going through the whole integration process, company out of California, we're traveling back and forth. And five days before the deal was supposed to close, it fell apart. Another oh. company offered 500 million more than us. Oh. Company was left at a standstill. And I saw it as a perfect opportunity at that point. <laughs> I'm not the kind of guy to just sit around and collect a check. I'd rather, I'm a builder, right? So I want to get out there and just go execute and make something happen. And that's when I came home. And Kelly was actually sick at the time. But I said, honey, I think it's, it's time. I'm going to take the leap. And literally took the leap of faith. We uh, had no formal business plans. We, we, we didn't really know exactly what we were going to do. We just knew we were going to build a great tech company and get to $100 million in revenue in 10 years. That's what we do. <laughs> How we're going to do it, we'll figure that out, right? It's like jump that's out awesome. of the plane and build the plane, right, in the process. <laughs> But <laughs> in essence, was the concept or the approach that we took. And um, what we knew and realized is that we had a great skill and capability in the sales technology segment. And the question was, where else could we apply it? What, what could we do with that? And how do we go big with that? Um, quickly, we came to realize, you know, stick with what you know and what you love. Um, the industry is, is a great industry to be a part of. Um, know it inside and out. It's, it, there's mm -hmm. definitely nuances that people just don't understand from outside the industry. Right. Um, the cloud, this cloud concept was kind of evolving <laughs> at that point, right? And nobody really understood what, what was there and what was happening and the disruption that was coming. Um, and we placed a bet on Salesforce, our partnership with Salesforce. Um, I think we chose the right horse at the time. And then when mobile came out and you know the iPad came out, we were one of the first companies or the first company in the industry to actually launch an app for the industry on the iPad. Um, big, big stuff, big moves, yeah. great times. What was it like um, having to build something that was kind of dependent upon or piggybacking onto another software? I mean, what was that like technically? And then in addition to that, how did that feel like, did that feel pretty risky to do or did you feel pretty secure in, in your bet on them? It, it was a pretty simple analysis for us, actually, right? I mean, because I had been a buyer, right? So Siebel was like the main player at the time that was ripe for disruption. SAP and others were trying to get into the space, but it, they just really didn't have the exactly. right approach there, right? Um, <clears throat> so for us, it was build, buy, or partner, right? If you think about just a simple view. Sure. And we can't build anything because we just don't have the resources right now. It's me and a co-founder, and it's, we took the leap, and we just don't have the time or the resources to actually build something from the ground up. we got to start making money right away, right? Mm -hmm. So that was part of it. For us, we had about three months of cash in the bank, right? So and we've never had a second income in our household. And, um, yeah, and, and that's a great thing for our kids because Kelly's been yeah, home with absolutely. the kids the whole time. 
But the challenge was we just had a limited cash supply, so we had to start That's selling right, deals yeah. right away, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so build, not an option. Buy, not an option. We don't have any money, right? So partner was really the, the viable option to look at where do we partner with the right technology platform and actually go scale a company that way. Interesting. Okay, very good. Um, so two things. Do you have any advice for non-technical founders, like someone that has a passion or expertise in a subject matter, but not necessarily in technology, or maybe even in business, but they just have a passion in a technical subject matter. So, you know, that's kind of what you did. You knew about this industry, you knew all that. Um, what kind of, if you were to be doing that again today and trying to start fresh, are there any shortcuts that you see that you are glad you did, or what kind of advice do you have for people that feel like they're kind of constrained by the fact that they're not a technical developer or something? I think, you know, the, the, the main challenge there is surrounding yourself with the right people, right? So as quickly as possible, try to find that technical co-founder that you can work with, I think is one approach, one element, or a company that you can work with and, and rely on to fulfill those needs. Um, you know, this platform concept right at the time, that made a lot of sense for us. Would I do another deal with Salesforce today? I'm not sure about that. Right, I think it's a different time today. They're, they've evolved to a, a, you know, they are now the new Oracle, right? Or coming up on the heels of Oracle pretty fast here. So the question is, who is the next generation of technology like that? That's what I would be looking for, is what is that next wave of things, right? I think this is, okay. they're a dominant force, they're, they're doing well, but it, that, that ship has sailed, right? So it's, it's time to move on to the next technology platform. And that's, you know, there's new stuff coming up every day and you just got to find the right partners and I think you got to educate yourself, right. right? There's there's so much great content out there today that it's it's not that hard to figure out what what is actually happening, what's emerging as the next trend, next wave, right? Slack, for example, would be a good example of something that's kind of came into the market and is just dominating right now, right? So how do you right. leverage that in, into your solution for right. a simple uh, scenario? Okay, very good. So. Um, another thing, you did bootstrap your company, and um, in reverence to the whole like pitching an investor thing, because there are so many important places that that does have to happen, I also have a lot of respect for entrepreneurs that do figure out how to, to lift something off the ground when there aren't opportunities available for them. And here in Phoenix, because we are new to having opportunities for capital, a lot of people have had to bootstrap because that was the opportunity that we had available. But um, looking back at that, having done it that way, what do you feel, do you have any do's or don'ts for people that are facing a situation that they don't know how to get the capital, maybe even they aren't in their situation the right type of um, investment opportunity for being attractive, maybe they're not SaaS or something, but what do you have as far as do's or don'ts for finding ways to be scrappy and bootstrap a company? I think you, you have to just go for it, right? I mean, it's, it's um, the way we did it, we started selling deals, right? Instead of selling investors, we were selling customers and funding our success that way going forward. And that's how we were just continuing to bankroll the company. The more deals we sold, the more we were able to invest into the company, continue to expand and hire more people uh, to help us get to that next level. Um, and, and so primarily, I mean, we started off as a Makes services sense. organization up front, right? We were doing professional services engagements early on, started layering in managed services, which was fantastic, which we, you know, we were securing 12, 24 month contracts um, at, at pretty sizable numbers, right? And, and scaling that that way. And that kept the lights on. Um, and then enabled us to now start to hire more people and go off to that next level, go secure more clients, go continue to stack and scale up. Um, and, and, you know, looking back, when we won our first deal, it's really when we probably should have went back, like our first major deal is when we should have started looking for capital from the outside. But we just didn't feel plugged in. We didn't even know where to right. start with all of that. And hence, part of what I'm trying to work on now is to help simplify that going forward. Very cool. Very cool. Um, all right. So when it came to actually scaling your company, once you guys got it off the ground, got a couple good deals in and had a platform and a foundation, when it came to scaling, how did you maintain um, the culture of your company as you grew? Because you guys grew reasonably quickly. I mean, you you really did go quick. Yeah, from 2006 to our exit was in May of 2013. So we launched in March of 2006. Right. Um, and we scaled to about 100 employees. So on completely bootstrapped organic growth and, and just layering in. And we, we ran a smart business. You know, I, I think that was our approach and model to it all was 
we delivered a profitable um, year after year result um, and, and just had consistency with all of that. So that, that's something, again, when we look back on it, we probably could have scaled a lot faster. I mean, we did a good thing. We sure. built a great company, but I know we could have gone a lot bigger, a lot faster. And that, that's the one thing when I look back that I, you know, if we would have had access to the right resources, I think we could have built something even bigger. Well, I say you did pretty good, but hindsight is twenty twenty. Um, so how did the decision to exit come about? So the decision to exit um, actually was never a decision that uh, we were pursuing, right? So we were not for sale. So we were actually out in the market. We, we had delivered over 100% growth in the year prior. Oh, wow. So this is 2012 timeframe. And uh, we were going out to market to seek growth capital to figure out how do we get to that 100 million mark and, and you know, we need to grow faster. And I don't want to change the time timeline, right? So <laughs> I'm a little stubborn that way. So you know, <laughs> deadlines are important to me and uh, <laughs> want to make sure that I, I follow through on my commitments, right? And uh, things that I'm, I'm going after. The wife is smiling. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> So that was the challenge, right? So we're five years in and we're trying to figure out like this is not gonna happen organically. So we have, to, we have to go get capital. And at that point, we were also getting a lot of exposure, different events that we were participating in, Inc. 500 stuff and Dreamforce and all these different events. All of a sudden I'm getting all these inbound inquiries, right? All these investors calling. And the first wave of them, I had no idea what I was talking about, right? So now I'm like <laughs> drilling these guys and I'm, I'm learning through that first wave of conversation to then get to the next conversation set and uh, be a little more sophisticated in my approach and the, <laughs> and the dialogue that we had, right? So and it was good. It was a good learning example, uh, process that we went through. And then we started to hone in on, okay, what do we want, right? And what type of deal are we looking for? How are we going to position this company? How much money do we need? All of that stuff we had to figure out. Um, as we're going through that conversation and we're starting to nail down, you know, options with investment banks and all of that good stuff, IMS presented themselves as an option. As a, as a partner, I should say, a strategic partner to help us scale and grow the company, uh, look at ways of how we could collaborate with each other. My first meeting with them, uh, official meeting around the topic, was in Hoboken, New Jersey, I think in like June of 2012. And it took that long, from that conversation to May of 2013, for us to actually get a deal done. Wow. So at that point, they, they were exploring you know, the partnership conversation. I invited them out to come visit with the company and take a peek at uh, what we had going on. And from there, that led to the discussion around a potential acquisition and what that would look like. And for us, it made a lot of sense. You know, we were, like I said, we weren't for sale. It wasn't something that I was chasing or needed to do. The company was in solid position. We were continuing to grow. Uh, you know, we had different opportunities that we were looking at. But um, IMS, solve, IMS is like the IBM of the space, right? So when I first entered into the industry, you hear the term IMS, and it was just you know, it was an amazing company in a space that was doing big things and just really a dominant force in the industry. So to be acquired by them, it was a pretty powerful kind of honor roll yeah. uh, thing that, that took place, I think, for the company as a whole. But the main thing was the fact that they had operations in over 100 countries and you know, over two and a half billion in revenue with uh, some profit there, right? So the capital issue was off the table. And then the scaling issue is really what we got, was the ability to take the company global, right? From Chandler and literally take it into 100 different countries overnight. Um, so I spent the, the, fi you know, the following year just traveling around the world, helping take the company into new markets um, and priming those markets, having the conversations, training our teams there, Japan, China, so on, right? And uh, I mean, the, the access and the power that IMS had is, is, it was impressive. I mean, I, I was sitting in a meeting in Shanghai, and there's a guy in India that's in the crowd and says, hey, we got to get you to India. And I wasn't expecting to be in India the following week, right? Oh my gosh. So <laughs> wow. I ended up on a plane to India on Sunday, and they walked me into the top five pharmaceutical companies in the country. Wow. To the C-suite, right? I mean, that's, that's the power of what happened and, and the value that was brought to the table. Um, between the two, right? And so they had a great asset and resource, which is the data side. We had the technology, and how do we combine the two for a competitive advantage in the market? And right. uh, that's that was our decision process at that point was how fast, you know, this is a, a quick way to get to the goal. Right. Okay. So when when you look back um, at that transition that you went through selling the company. Is there anything you would do different or that you, I mean, selling a company, there are so many factors and so many pieces and parts and 
you know, the transition that you committed to and, and saw through, is there anything you would do different or any advice that you would give to people as they're looking toward an exit um, on how to structure it, just things that you liked about the way that you did it or didn't like? And we know you had an awesome law firm help you, so uh, that's, absolutely. Yeah. that's good. Osborne Maladon, right? OM uh, did so, a great job, so yeah. it definitely, I, you know, honestly, just to touch on that real quick, between Osborne Maladon and, and the resources, uh, Ariano specifically and Curzon, um, and Andy actually as well was part of the deal process, along with um, our CFO and a couple other strategic resources that we brought in, I mean, we were a small team against a due diligence team that was coming in and they were treating us like a public company. And we, we passed that test. Um, and that, that, was, that was a great kind of part of the outcome, cool. right? To say that uh, we, we were at that level that you know, it worked, it made sense, and we, uh, they, they were able to check all the boxes. But um, what was your question again? <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Is there anything you would do different or any advice you have for people as they would be looking at how to negotiate a sell? Like, yep. do you like the idea of staying on and helping with the transition or, you know, just anything that you learned from that process? So I stayed on for almost a year to see through the integration and kind of go through, went into it with an open mind, thinking that maybe I'll hang out inside of the enterprise and have fun with this or not. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think we came to the point where just start to realize, you know, once you're integrating this company into this mothership, so to speak, right, it's, uh, you just lose your influence and power over time, right? So, yeah. and, and it's just, uh, your role just changes. And I had a global role, I had a GM, you know, title and all of this, and it was good, good, great exposure, great opportunity. But in the end, I'm an entrepreneur is what I've learned, right? And this is, this is where I want to be and what I want to do is really helping early stage companies scale and grow and potentially doing another one at some point. So we'll, we'll see. But as it relates to you know, tips on, on what, uh, I think one, one thing to note is I did not share the deal, the details or, or the actual process that I was going through with the company. So I can do that because I owned 100% of the company at the time um, which is not, you know, that common, I guess. That's, that's a, one challenge. One, if you have investors, you have a board and all of that, obviously your board will be part of that process. Um, but I, I refuse to share it with the rest of the company too early and to scare them, right, so to speak. It's, that was my concern. I didn't want to freak people out. And then the deal, and in my mind, I always kind of looked at it like the deal's probably not going to happen. So I went into it with the mindset that this is going to be an exercise. We're going to go through it. We're going to get stronger from it, and we're going to move on to the next opportunity. But in most cases, you don't make it through successfully the first time around. And we were fortunate to be able to do that, but um, that was something that I think we did well. And I would probably encourage others to you know, be careful with that type of transaction and how you communicate that to your employees, because you just don't want to create distraction and fear of what, what might happen, right? So that, that was something, because throughout the entire process, you know, I'm, I'm negotiating that deal, but I'm also trying to run the company at the same time. Right, that's true. And, uh, you know, that's, it's a pretty intense time, pretty challenging, and you don't want to have other issues because people start departing and, and so on as a result, so. Right, okay, very good. So let's fast forward now and talk about the past couple of years. So um, let's talk just a little bit about when YesPHX yes, was born. I believe there were cigars involved, were there not? There were cigars. Where's Jonathan? <laughs> so we had, uh, yeah, there's a, so, so one of the things that happened, um, so I transitioned out in March of last year, so of 2014. So that's when I decided I'm going to leave the company and take a break. <laughs> so <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> For anyone that knows, this dude is uber busy, so his version <laughs> of a break, his wife is like, whatever. So that, that was a, you know, that, that decision in itself was a pretty significant challenge, right? I mean, the way to think about it, it's like you're leaving your, your, your soldiers on, on the battlefield, right? <laughs> and uh, you're, you're now going to retire. And, and that's, that was a really tough moment to, to make that call, but the, there was a process behind that. and. There was some health matters even on the home front that you know, kind of influenced some of the thinking behind it and when's enough enough and now it's time to, you know, for the first time in 18, 19 years or whatever it was to, to have the opportunity to actually take a break. So transitioned out. Um, one of the things that I hosted, I, I sent out an email kind of randomly to I think about 10 CEOs and everybody said yes to get together for dinner. And it was like less than 
24, 48 hours or something like that. And that's how it started, right? So we all got together. We had uh, a great dinner, had you know, some key advisors that I rely on in, in the community as well joined us for the dinner. And um, ended up smoking cigars and drinking scotch. And Jonathan uh, went away, came back the next day with, uh, or a couple days later with the Yes Phoenix concept and model, and that was it. It's, uh, it's helped uh, unify this community, so he's done a great job with that. So hats off to Jonathan for that. Absolutely. Very cool. Very good. Yeah, we're very grateful for SPHX around here and Jonathan. Um, all right, so a few other things that you're involved in, and we'll go through each one, but you have, do you say it, Martinez Ventures? Yep. abbreviated um, <laughs> and then you're a board member several places you are the chairman at invest southwest slash venture madness um, and now startup az so let's start with your venture company so what would you say is your profile as an investor i i just consider myself an angel investor at this point focused on seed deals you know okay. seed level deals so any anything that particularly excites you or like any any industry that you find especially interesting? It's one of those things, stick with what you know. Right? Okay. And um, yeah, you're not gonna find me doing real estate deals, guys. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Um, any favorite moments so far, um, having worked with some of the startups that you have worked with? It's, it's, there's a lot of fun moments. Um, you know, I think you know, as, as you spend more time with companies and entrepreneurs and provide guidance um, and they start to see breakthroughs, like that's, that's really where it's at. It's, um, that's, you know, just this past week, we, we see some great announcements between Campus Logic, Reply By, and Picmonic, you know, with Crazy. great progress. Pick great Monic, job, guys. Here tonight. It's all about the entrepreneurs making it happen, yeah. right? But uh, hopefully Crazy. being available to them as well and, and, and helping them through some of the decision processes that they have to make to get to those points, um, specifically around traction. I think traction is the biggest Absolutely. issue that a lot of companies face and um, spending time in that area and trying to help them unlock the growth is, is hugely valuable, right. I, I think. Any advice for startups that are looking to try and navigate the angel scene here in Phoenix? It's all about relationships, right? I think, uh, one, you have to build a great company and have a great concept and something that's interesting and appealing. I think you have to help make it obvious um, for investors to understand what it is that you're doing. Um, and then two, you just have to engage the network, right? You have to get involved, you gotta get out there. And I think um, between the Commerce Authority and what they were doing with the Innovation Challenge and that being a great uh, flow of uh, deal flow in essence, right? Getting your, your name out there as an organization and going through that process, that's actually seeding all of the investors in, in the community because there's a lot of judges totally in the process. Uh, same thing for Venture Madness. I mean, Venture Madness, is gonna have 30 plus judges evaluating all of those companies going through the process, right? As well as all the investors that will show up at the event. Um, that's, that's, it's all part of it. So it's, it's, it's gonna take time, nothing happens overnight. I mean, if, if I came up to you tomorrow and said, hey, can you give me a million dollar check? And it's probably not gonna happen right there at the spot, right? It's, it's gonna be something that we, we have to, as a community, I think we have to get better at connecting the, the right resources, right? The right investors with the right companies that have the same interest um, and making that efficient. Um, that's something I, th I think is an opportunity still. So. Absolutely. Tell us about Venture Madness. Explain it from your perspective for those let, that haven't heard it. Let me rewind real quick too, sure. sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, the angel groups as well is another segment, right? So, and I'm part of both ATI and Desert Angels, right? So I jumped right in to, to both groups want to get a perspective, kind of hear a lot of feedback from the community, it's, you know, some negative feedback here and there in terms of time and process and so on. But it is a diligent process and they only look at 15 to 20 companies a year. So you got to recognize that it is very competitive as well. Um, so you have to be competitive, right? You have to be the best one that they want and, and you know, at those presentations. Um, but building rapport and, and relationships with the key leaders of those organizations and now Canyon Angels and so on is an important element. I think that's something that requires time on your part as an entrepreneur, as a founder, as a CEO, to build those relationships and establish trust and, and prove that you're gonna follow through on what you're saying. You know, it's interesting. Um, I used to be really annoyed by anything that, where relationships had leverage or more opportunity. But then I realized that the playing field for people to build relationships is level. 
And so it's still a level playing field. Anybody can get out there and can get involved and can be helpful and can meet people and do that work. And yes, once you build the relationships, you could say that you have a little leg up on someone that's cold walking into the situation, but they have the same opportunity. So it really is available to anyone out there. They just have to do the work, like you said. Yep. But it's fun you with you guys. It's showing up and drinking with people half the time. There so you go. <laughs> it's good work. All right. So now Venture Madness? Now Venture Madness. So, uh, yeah, so I, I decided, uh, I, well, I was invited, I should say. Um, what was it? <laughs> So that, that was my first duty post IMS, right? So I, I, I transitioned out at the end of February, first week of March is Venture Madness, and I was invited in as a judge um, and participated <laughs> in that process. And by the way, I mean, so building 360, that whole cycle that we went through, I never participated in any Invest Southwest events or any other events like it um, in town. It was definitely partly time. I was traveling quite a bit, um, never was able to fit those things in. So I'm not sure what it looked like at that point in time. Uh, but Venture Madness itself, that, that new launch and new format that came out was actually pretty cool. It was pretty exciting and, and I think uh, created a, a fun atmosphere and environment uh, for companies to compete, get some exposure. Um, and was compelling enough for me to then participate uh, when I was asked to uh, chair in the following year. So co-chaired in 2014, 2015, and have taken over as chairman as of March of this year for, for the organization. Have a great board in place, um, great uh, executive committee in place as well, and then we have a steering committee that's uh, you know made up of all of our sponsors and, and community. So. so explain to us what it is and who needs to know and how they get involved. So Venture Madness is a competition where 64 companies compete March Madness style, right? So and who's, who's been to Venture Madness yet? All right. <laughs> who's planning to apply this year? Yeah. All right. Yeah. I want to see more hands there. But uh, it's definitely a competition I think that everybody can participate in in terms of early stage companies with high growth potential um, and really have what it takes to, to compete, right? So I think we need to get as many companies exposed and into this process. There's $100,000 at stake. Last year we were at 50,000, this year we're at 100,000, so that's a huge step up. Um, and we're also working on some other elements to figure out how we get investors more engaged as well. So that's, you'll see we had about 250 people at the conference this past year. We're shooting for three to 350. Um, and again, it's, it's investors locally as well as uh, regionally, I would say, or even some nationally, but. Is it the first week of March? It is the first week of March, March <laughs> 2nd to the All 4th, right. great point. So block your calendars from like mid-February to mid-March for everything startup, you guys. <laughs> and the application window is now open, so you can actually submit your application today um, and it'll close in December 17th, so that's your deadline. The first 25 companies to come through the process on the application side will actually be invited into a uh, exclusive dinner that we're hosting December 3rd. So that's going to be a, a dinner with a town hall format with notable investors that we're, we're inviting wow. in and working on right now Very to be cool. a, a key value to the early companies coming in and, and try to help and support those companies as best we can. Wow, that's really community. cool. Yeah, that's terrific. Um, and as a community, we can get involved as well because at VentureMadness.com, once the 64 companies are selected, we can see the brackets and we can vote and try and pick who is going to make it to the end. And isn't there like a People's Choice Award sometimes too? There is. Yeah. And I think so a company that's here your startups. won. Pick Monic won the People's Choice Award last ah, year. Very so. cool. And then Camp Campus Logic took the overall. So. Yeah. So it's a great way to get to know who's who's working on things in the community too. It's I think another way. key point just to touch on too is we know of at least eight or so companies that have raised money in aggregate over 16 million since the conference. So I think there's a good velocity effect I think that we're I seeing agree. and definitely good exposure that's coming out of the conference that uh, is helpful. Yeah, back to um, that, get out there and get visibility. Yeah, and access to the network, access to mentors and all of that good stuff as well. So. Looking Very forward good. to working with you all and uh, hopefully seeing you as part of the competition. Good, good. All right, so let's switch it up to Startup AZ. Describe the vision and how people in the community can participate or help. So let's talk quickly just about Team Arizona, right? So do you want to touch on that? <laughs> well, sure. Um, so as you guys have noticed over the past um, couple of years, a lot of people have just stepped up and volunteered to help in any way possible, connecting people to each other, helping each other find the resources, the opportunities that they need. And um, I think it was, was it Bob? 
um, Bob that first sent out the first email to, I think there were like 15 or 20 of us on the first email that said, why don't we try and like figure out a way to like corral in everything that's happening and what everybody's doing and how people can access all of this awesomeness that everybody's trying to help each other with and all of the resources that we have. And then that very quickly turned into a mailing list of like 60 people that were all shooting all these emails around and really trying to find ways to wrap our mind around some kind of a way to explain what's available and how we can access all of the opportunity around us. As it evolved, it turned into a Slack channel um, or a several Slack channels where people can get engaged and can contribute. And so there are things like an ask channel where people can put up an ask and say, hey, you know, I have this product that I'm building and I need to kind of find a way to talk to someone in this space. Does anyone know anyone? Or there's an events channel well, where I'm always like, it's startup grind time again. Everybody's kind of posting information that's happening. Um, there's a general channel where people post silly things and fun things and just things that they're thinking about, an article that they read. Like People are just really engaged in working together and finding ways to collaborate and share what's happening so we can share each other's successes, boost each other in every way possible, and try and accelerate the success of each other and everyone else that we run into along the way. So. Yep, well, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it also turned into a dinner series. So that, that's, I think that's the other part of it, right? So I think there's a sense of community that everybody's searching for. Um, you know, you hear that concept around other markets where things are more concentrated. And I think that's actually happening now in a virtual way through Team AZ and the Slack channel of what we're doing and how we're connecting the community as a whole. But in addition to that, we're actually hosting these dinners every other month or so, I think is a schedule right now. Mm -hmm. We're out of the first dinner, you know, the, the, the theme of generosity and us being the most generous community for entrepreneurs um, has, has kind of emerged, right, as a, as a key value that we have, I think, as, as a community. Um, and this is based on feedback as well that we're hearing from people who are looking into Phoenix and trying to figure out how to start up an organization here or launch an accelerator or whatever it is, and they're, they're feeling that and they're, they're providing that feedback, which is fantastic. Um, so we need to continue to do that, but how do we embrace that? How do we now also solve the fact that, you know, there are some capital issues, you know, in terms of venture capital and funding and so on that, that also exists here? And how do we marry the two? And that's, that conversation came out of the first dinner, and by the fourth dinner, Startup AZ was born, right? So we actually worked with the Arizona Community Foundation to get that established. Um, set the foundation up. It is a nonprofit fund um, where one of the things to note as an organization, 360 Vantage was committed towards helping and supporting the communities we operated in. We built it into the DNA, into the culture of the business. Um, we never had something simple to engage with on a local level, so we went and adopted our own charity, so to speak, and supported that charity for the seven years of our existence. Um, and, and made, a, I think, some good impact and donated more over time as, as things evolved and as we had more people. So we donated our time, we donated capital, and so on. Um, so the 1% model is a general concept that existed prior. Uh, Salesforce is actually known very well for, for a lot of the work that they've done around this as well. Um, and we're looking at how do we create our own vehicle to do that that's going to support our local ecosystem. And that's what StartupAZ.org is, and it's an opportunity for entrepreneurs or companies to commit 1% of their equity to the fund, right? That's, that's a pay it forward concept, and, and it doesn't cost you anything to do today, right? Outside of putting 1% on your cap table, right, and making that, that pledge. Um, and it's gonna pay it forward into the future, right, as you guys are successful and continue to grow and scale and have successful outcomes you know in terms of exits that capital will get deployed into the fund that fund will now evaluate deals and will co-invest at this point with other deals that are taking place here through either our angel groups or notable investors who are leading the deals um, and so there'll be a full-fledged investment committee there's going to be a full-fledged board um, and again and in partnership with the arizona uh, community foundation to help in terms of managing and, and operating the overall uh, foundation. So 80% of the funds will be allocated towards uh, actual investments towards companies, and 20% will be grant-based, where it'll actually go for entrepreneurs who need to get to New York City for some major pitch event, which is gonna help you know, put Phoenix on the map, right, and their company, and hopefully drive success. 
um, those types of things are what we're you know what we're looking at right now. All of that is very early stage, so um, that we're still working through you know formulating this. It's a startup at this point, right? So it's in the very <laughs> early stages of uh, growth. You know, getting initial traction around donors is the top priority right now for uh, now to the end of the year to have enough capital to go into next year. So we've seed funded it initially with 100K. Um, Mario seed funded it with 100K. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. So I know. Very cool. Getting it started. Thank you. But, Thank you. Um, you know, and it's really not about that. It's the bottom line is how do we get these things started? How do we get moving? And I think another key point to note is I'm also leading from the front in the sense of the portfolio will commit is committing 1% of its returns towards the fund. Right. Sure, sure. So it's yeah. it's not, you know, and this is a community deal. So it, it is a community deal. It's owned by the community. This is not me or any one of us in terms of Team AZ. So Brandon Clark has been instrumental in making this all happen as well. Uh, Brad Janenga, Jonathan and others um, are part of the team. Fred Von Graff that we meet on a weekly basis that has helped focus the effort and get this done. And hopefully is also showing to the community that big things can get done in very short windows of time, right? And uh, we need to continue to do more of that, right? Now the question is, what's the next big set of challenges that we want to pursue going into 2016, and how do we go execute against that um, and support you know, the community and get you guys engaged and help out in terms of what do we want this to look like in the next five years, and how do we make that happen, right? And I think that's what Team AZ is focused on. Very good, very good. Well, uh, we're lucky to have you here, so thank you for your continual support and, and work in our community. Uh, before we move on to our Q&A, heads up guys, you have some Q&A time, um, and our little final question series, is there anything else you'd like to share with people here tonight? So as I was thinking about this this week, you know, coming, coming into tonight, it's like, what is the main thing, right? It's, it's, uh, success is not free. Right, it's, it's, it's a big challenge, a big commitment. I think as entrepreneurs, you just need to be clear on that. Um, there are a lot of sacrifices along the way. And you have to do what it takes to, to win, right? And don't give up. Follow through and chase that dream and go make it happen. But recognize that it takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, and it's, it's, uh, you, you have to be all in in order to win, so. Very good, thank you. All right, so we're going to get to know Mario just a little bit here, you guys. So we play this little game called 21 Questions Rapid Fire. So I'm just going to ask you some pretty simple questions, and you're going to just tell me your thoughts on them, all right? So first one, cats or dogs? Dogs. <laughs> all right. Grew up with a cat. I had a Siamese cat early. Uh oh, that'll do it. <laughs> all right. Beer or wine? Beer. Oh, yeah. that looked like a tough decision there. I was going to say vodka, but... <laughs> <laughs> vodka? You know what? I get that like half the time. I don't know what's up with that. All right. Sushi or tacos? I was just in Mexico for the last two weeks and tacos. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Favorite app? Flipboard. Hmm. Still. What does Flipboard do? So it's a, it's a good magazine kind of reader oh, for Flipboard. Twitter and all of okay. that. Yeah. I'm with you, I'm with you. So, I mean, it's been around for a while, but yeah. that's probably... Okay. Yeah, outside of email, obviously. Right? So. <laughs> right. Favorite operating system? This is like a political statement. Wow. What do you guys think? <laughs> it's your question. It's all, it's all. <laughs> It's all, it's all Apple. Of all right. He's a Mac guy. It's so we, we shifted the company pretty early on. Actually, the first generation iPhone we, we had, and we shifted, uh, converted the entire company. That's all we had. We never had desk phones. We never had servers. We never had any of that oh, stuff, wow. right? So, <coughs> well, excuse me. So the first gen iPhones, I mean, were, it was pretty funny walking into client sites, and they were like, oh, that's cute. Right? <laughs> that's <laughs> that's awesome. not going to be anything, right? The BlackBerry <laughs> owns the market. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Favorite holiday? Christmas. Favorite car? <laughs> I, I have to say Tesla. <laughs> but uh, grew up, grew up loving Porsche now. So I've, I've, right. I've driven one of those for a while. So. Well, don't worry. Um, Michael Hool has a Tesla here tonight, so we can give away his instead of yours. So I think Curzon offered oh, some rides Curzon too. too. Perfect. All right. 
All right, favorite vacation spot? The beach. Any in particular? Nope. All right. <laughs> favorite book? Favorite book, as it relates to business, uh, The Breakthrough Company is a great book uh, to, to, to read. It's like good to great, but really focused on companies in our category, I would say, right? It's how do you get from one to 100 million, right? Hmm. So there's a lot of good concepts around that. Then they studied, I believe it was about nine companies and figured out how they got there. So that's definitely a book worth worth reading, and I don't think you see it, you know, yeah. that that actively at this point. But hmm. worth taking the time. Favorite movie or TV show? The Patriot. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Favorite musician. Favorite musician. Um, so, I mentioned my DJ days, right? Uh -huh. So if you looked at my playlist, it's probably 90s hip hop. So, <laughs> everything in that category. So. All right, true confessions, I like it. All right, so what's your go-to karaoke song? None. Should we be asking Kelly these yeah, yeah. questions? Because I feel like she knows the answers. No, no karaoke, I know my limits. So. All right, that's fair. Anything you collect? Hope. Hotel room keys and uh, air miles. <laughs> All right. Any unusual skills or talents that we should know about? Or that we shouldn't know. know about? Are there? <laughs> no. no? I don't think so. All right. That's, that's okay. <laughs> that, we can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what would you consider your top strength in business? Top strength? Um, I would have to say it's, it's leading teams to solve big problems. I mean, that's the essence of it, and uh, it's fun. I get to do it at scale now, in, in a sense, um, trying to help out here and there between different companies. But um, you know, one, one thing I talk about as it relates to my current role is it's probably the closest thing I, I can think about as being a grandparent, right? Because I get to come in, hang out with the company for a couple of days, and or you know, and, and, and right, the parents, right? right? The entrepreneurs, and then I'm leave, <laughs> and then come back next month and, and see how things are going, right? Yeah. So, That's but awesome. um, yeah. Okay, what profession other than entrepreneurship would you attempt, like in a different life type of scenario? Driving a race car. <laughs> All right. What is the best compliment someone can give you? I think uh, anything about my kids. You know, I think we started as early. You know, young parents, um, and it's it's definitely been a priority for us and making sure that uh, we hopefully and we'll we'll know over the next few years. I'm sure that the true results of the testing are going to come out. <laughs> no <All right>? pressure. <laughs> no pressure, Sadie. <laughs> but um, you know, anything that uh, indicates that we we're doing a good thing there, it's 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 a good compliment. Very cool. What's a cause you are passionate about? So. I always used to ask this question to a lot of people just in random, right? So what if you if money wasn't an issue, what would you focus on? Right? So if you, you're done, you've cashed out and, and what would you do? Right? So a lot of people would answer, you know, focus on, on charities related to dogs or kids or whatever the case. And clearly I think what I've come to learn and realize about myself, it's all about entrepreneurship. Right? And that's that's the heart of it. And then the secondary thing is around at risk kids, right? Kids that uh, need a chance and, and live in a bubble that they need to realize that there's other options and opportunity beyond that bubble. So catering to that as uh, the other cause is uh, an important element for us as a family. Very good. What's one thing on your bucket list? A safari. All right. All right. So um, you referenced a couple of times that you were a DJ for a while. So <laughs> we would love for you to tell us your DJ name. And there are some people in the community that have specifically asked that you tell us your DJ name. No? <laughs> <laughs> She's going to tell. All right. Kelly says that it's okay. So. so, so you know, we can't tell anybody, though, okay? It stays in this room. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's after a Nintendo character. Really? <laughs> There you go. That's Super it. Mario. I like it. I like it. All right, Tom, make sure and tell Jonathan because he really wanted to know, okay? <laughs>
<laughs> All right, very good. Well, uh, we're going to take a minute for some Q&A time. So um, we don't have crowd mics in action tonight. Sorry. So you're going to have to speak really loudly. And Mary, if you don't mind, just kind of repeat the question a little bit so we can capture sure. it on video. So who has a question for him? All right. Hello. My name is Matt Sherman. I'm a co-founder of Fusion Apps. And when the application for Adventure Madness launched in October 1st, we were taking a look at it. We saw there was a section for economics of the company. And if we're very early stage and our app isn't, isn't developed yet, we haven't launched yet, what would you say we do for that section? We don't have unit sold or apps sold or like how much it costs per person to get that app. What would you say for a very early stage startup right during that section? You have to have some sort of target and goal, okay. right? So just establish what's your projected forecast, right? Assuming all goes well, what's gonna what's that gonna look like? All right, who else? Ryan? So Mario, you have a unique perspective to look at a lot of different companies performing at all different stages. Rather than just saying the company's not revenue strong enough, what is there one fundamental thing you look for in companies? Whether it's their sales process is broken or their marketing's not in shape or their products maybe not in the market, but is there a consistent thing that you look for that would pretty much wipe a company out of your due diligence? Like, or is there a common trend that you find that is broken in the whole scaling process? Yeah, so, so one of the things that I see on a regular basis is sales and marketing. There's always a, the, just the commercial side of getting the, the product to market. Right, and getting customers to buy. I see a lot of companies that are, or entrepreneurs that are really good at selling investors and actually raising money, but not necessarily able to sell their product yet yeah. effectively, right? And to be able to drive traction and drive scale behind it. Um, so that's something I zone in on quite a bit just to figure out whether or not it's doable. Is it a product issue? Is it an execution issue? Is it a training issue, right? And if it's a training issue, then we can work through some of that. That's solvable, right? But um, if the product is not there and that's why sales are not happening, that's a different issue, right? So. Kyle. Uh, what's, what's the most important metric you look at when you're looking, if you speak about traction a lot. Um, I've heard different investors talk about MRR, <coughs> cost per acquisition, What's a metric that you like to key on? What's something you, you scan the page and look for when you're looking at a deal? It's, it's growth rate, really. I mean, when you, right? So there, there's a conversation that's happening, right? The first time you meet an investor, you're gonna say, this is where we're at. And that's it, the clock starts ticking, right? So now it's, I'm gonna check in 30 days from now, where are you now, right? And how are things evolving from there? and how fast are you actually moving? Did, you claimed you were gonna to get to 1,000 users or 10,000 users, did you actually accomplish that? In most cases, not even my number. It's, it's more about what is the entrepreneur saying they're gonna do, and are they actually delivering on that promise? Right, so it's, it's finding that and, and uh, you know, figuring out what, yeah, each deal is different, right, depending on the company, uh, and what's really important at that stage of the company's life cycle. Right, so it could just be bottom line is drive user growth, right? So what is happening around that? Is that taking place? In other cases, it could be tickets sold. It could be revenue related, whatever. We have to see that pull through actually happening. And that's, that's what I care about most. I mean, if, if a claim is being made, then you know, I, I definitely expect it to be followed through. Can I get a follow up? Sure. <laughs> One more. So most of us as entrepreneurs, we overestimate. We try to say, hey, we're gonna get this. <laughs> We're gonna get here and we fall short. I've done it a million times, you know, this, it's not a new story. How do you deal with that? How do you look at that realistically? Obviously you probably look at it and go, sure, you're gonna hit that, you know. But what, what's, what's your reaction? Because obviously as an entrepreneur, we always like to, to hear, we like to get inside your head. So what's inside your head at that moment? <laughs> It, the, the ultimate question is, did you drive any growth, right? If the answer is zero, then that's a problem, right? Like, <laughs> if, if it's, you know, you, you projected 500 and you got to 450 or 350, like that's, that's a conversation to be had to understand why, what, what worked, what didn't work, right? And how, let's see what happens this next month, right? Um, but if you just get to 10 and you're shooting for 50, you know, 500, that's a problem, right? then it's, it's just a red flag at that point that we gotta understand what's actually happening here. It's an execution issue either on the entrepreneur side 
or the product is weak or whatever the case, right? Marketing's just not working, not converting deals, you know, and this is the sales process side of things as well. I think a lot of people underestimate sales and the sales model and process and how to engage into, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat, so to speak, right, to get deals done. <laughs> that's, that's something that is just problem solving. Each one is a different puzzle. So, it depends. <laughs> Consulting answer. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Oh, good. Go ahead. Corey Monorch from LondonTech.com. Bringing in someone like IMS to, to work at your company in a proposed sale, that's a scary thing to do. So you're, you're running an operation, and you've got some kind of trade secrets, things you've developed. They're coming in to look at all of this in, in what you described as a public company due diligence process. How did that make you feel? What what were you thinking about it? It was uh, it was a high risk. Great great question. So the question is, you know, going through the process with IMS for an acquisition, potential acquisition, and exposing ourselves in that conversation because we knew they were interested in the space at that point. Um, right, so one way or the other, we're either going to get married or we're going to be competing, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it was, uh, it was definitely a risky time, and, and part of that, one of the things that we did that was unique, I wouldn't say unique, but unusual, I guess, is we spent a lot of time around the LOI, the letter of intent, and structuring the deal and making sure that we were clear on what the boundaries were. Right? And if the deal was going to move anywhere outside of that, then the deal was off. And so we actually negotiated quite a bit of the deal on the front side before we signed the, the, the actual LOI, which is when the due diligence cycle kicked off. And they had two months, 60 days, to come in, do a deep dive into the company. They sent like 14 or 15 people out, including the president of the U.S., Right, so it was, a, it was a serious process that we went through, but at that point, yeah, it was game on, right? Everything was opened up. Um, our legal documents were opened up. They knew exactly who we were talking to from an investor side. Er everything became really clear, but they also knew we weren't kidding, right? So we were in the process of looking at capital partners to help us scale the company, and one way or the other, something had to happen, right? So it was a risk that we, we had no choice but to take, you know, if we, if we wanted to look at it the opportunity in, uh, in a serious way. Otherwise, it, it would have just been off the table. Like trying to, we, we looked at, you know, opportunities to say, let's put a breakup fee, right? <laughs> it's not gonna happen, not at this stage. No. Thank you. Jonathan? What's the most exciting thing uh, for you about Arizona right now, what's happening in the start of the ecosystem? Well, I think it's this. I mean, it's, it's really, it's community coming together and making it happen, right? I mean, it's, I think we're seeing it in multiple areas and, and uh, at different levels, different audiences that we're catering to, I think, throughout the entire uh, state, even, I would say. Um, I could tell you in 2006, when we took the leap to start the company, I never felt like there was an ecosystem here, right? It was, I felt alone, right? I, I think that was an issue that I've heard repeatedly from other founders over the years as well. And it's, I think that's the part that I think we're working on solving right now, and I think we're seeing it happen. So it's an exciting time. Um, I think we are seeing great progress. I think we're seeing you know, consistent hits starting to come, right? So companies are, have positive announcements coming out. They're showing growth and positive growth. We need more of it, right? I mean, it's just still just the beginning in my mind, right? So I think we have a, the next 10 years ahead of us in figuring out, like, how do we get great at this game? How do we build great companies? And I think this community is coming together in the right way at the right time and right people taking an interest and, and uh, caring and supporting. So it's, it's, it's happening. That's, that's uh, what I'm most excited about. And uh, it's home for us, right? So we've been here 13 years now almost and um, we're not leaving. So we got a place in Flagstaff and get down to Mexico quite a bit and we love the lifestyle here, right? I mean, we love the quality of life overall. We love, you know, the blue sky, you know, 80% of the time. Um, we can live anywhere right now and we choose to stay here. Very cool, very good. All right, one more question. Yeah, David. So now that you sold your company and 
how do you actually replace that? Because a lot of entrepreneurs get to a point and then they sell that one thing they work so passionately on. How do you replace that? How do you build after that? Great question, David. So thank you for that. Um, the question is, how do you replace the void? You know, after you sell your company, and kind of move on to the next stage. Um, I think that the the key there is there's a lot to do on the other side. <laughs> there's a lot of opportunity. I think a lot of founders kind of get nervous, like, well, what am I going to do post deal? Um, I've seen that a few times, and I think there's just plenty of options, right? I could do what I'm doing now in terms of getting in the game from an investor standpoint and supporting companies that way, or, you know, I think there's always the potential of starting another company and going after that, too. Right now, you know, one of the things, I didn't mention this earlier, but I committed to my family that I would not start another company for at least a year. We're past that year point, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, we're going to take a break, right? And uh, this is my version of a break, right? So this is, uh, we're having fun with it. <laughs> and, but at the same time, you're 100% you're right. I mean, I, when I took on kind of a personal project because I wasn't sure what was, what's going to happen post-deal, right? Like, once I leave the company, like, what am I going to do that following Monday, right? <laughs> and it was pretty wild. That was actually one of the craziest experiences. Your email's locked out. You have no more emails. You go from receiving 400 emails a day to zero, right? No responsibility. It was a pretty awesome experience, and it lasted good, you know, for a few months that way. But <laughs> um, over time, it started to build back up, and I think I'm back to the, uh, you know, email challenge <laughs> but um yeah so personal project was one thing that you know made sure i had something teed up to keep me keep me focused and busy for a little while and then uh, as i started to get involved into the community that kind of naturally progressed and you know has blossomed into um, investing time into these types of projects kind of community projects in my mind all right well ladies and gentlemen give them a hand thank you so much Mary. thank you